Yeah, welcome to this panel at M for Music. M for Music, as most of you might know, is a project by the Mikro Kulturprozent. And today at this panel here in Moods, we're talking about jazz, of course. We're talking about jazz and how it speaks to young people. Um, in particular, we're going to look at a project called Tomorrow's Warriors from London. My name is Florence. I'm usually at the radio at SRF 2 Kultur. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Janine Irons of Tomorrow's Warriors, co-founder and CEO. And um, do you want to say something about yourself, Janine? Um, okay, so I'm from London. Um, I've been working on the Tomorrow's Warriors project, program, uh, lifelong work for 32 years now with Gary Crosby, who's coming back in the room in a minute. Um, yeah, and so it's a, it's a lifelong passion um, to be developing young jazz musicians and making sure this music can stay alive um, and just keep going and evolving. So do you want to say one or two words about what Tomorrow's Warriors is? Okay, in, in a nutshell, um, Tomorrow's Warriors is a talent development agency, um, music educator, and um, creative producer. So we take young musicians on a journey, we say from the cradle to the stage, although the cradle for us starts at age 11. Um, but it is, we, we see talent development as a very holistic practice. Um, it's not just about training musicians as a diversion, it's about training them to become uh, leaders, to become great citizens, um, and to create great music so that the rest of us who want to listen to it have got something good to listen to. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And in order to have some visual of it as well, we've got a really cool video. Um, if it works. I was probably about 18 or so when I first got involved with Tomorrow's Warriors and I've been involved with it in some capacity ever since. Some of my bedrooms might go to a youth club where they be playing football. My youth club, if you like, was Tomorrow's Warriors, which was centred around people who wanted to play jazz music. I used to be there every weekend from beginning to end, just to be part of it. Like some of my greatest memories of being a teenager is having these rehearsals and just hanging out afterwards. I grew up there. I saw it as a place to be able to get the opportunity to perform, to travel, to learn more about jazz. And it was at a very high level, you know, pretty much all the gigs that we did were professional situations. I remember being in college, depping for Rod Young's in maybe Jazz Jamaica or Dennis Baptiste's quartet and gigging up and down the country. I was there 15, 16, 17, 18, which was really the foundation of my growth helped me get on into music, university, etc. It was definitely an experience, man, you know. I owe a lot to a place like Tomorrow's Warriors. What we need more in music is everyone to be represented because then when you see yourself as a young person in someone else, that's a power. And so that's what Tomorrow's Warriors brings to the table. People from all walks of life can kind of come and just experience music without having to worry about financial constraints. The crazy thing about it is that it's all free. It means that economic mobility isn't a factor in whether people take up music or not. And you want it to be a music that includes everyone from all sorts of brackets. We help students to learn who they really are and encourage them to take a risk artistically. You end up with a lot of very forward-thinking musicians and I think the proof of that is definitely in UK jazz at the moment. Tomorrow's Warriors really is a champion in, in keeping jazz alive and keeping it equal. You know, if you care about jazz music and care about how the music looks not just now, but how it's going to look in the future, in some way this is an investment in the face of British jazz. Wow. Um, I think there was Shabaka Hutchings. Yeah. Really cool video. There was um, Shabaka Hutchings of Shabaka and the Ancestors. I'm a big fan. And also a few glimpses of Nubaya Garcia in there. Yeah. We we're going to be working with, like, if there are any promoters in the room, <laughs> we're going to be working with Nubaya later with our um, orchestra. We, we have two orchestras, Jazz Jamaica All Stars and the New Civilization Orchestra. 
and we're going to be doing um, Stan Getz's Focus with 29 strings and piano and drums and Nabaya. So that's in September in London, 15th September. So be there. If anyone's in London. Um, so lots of things going on at Tomorrow's Warriors, and they have been going on since 1991. So 32 years is when you and Gary founded Tomorrow's Warriors. What did that look like? How did the London jazz scene look like then? Um, we have a saying in London, um, it's male, pale and stale. And so it's a lot of sort of old men with beards, basically, um, mm -hmm. and pr basically promoting, for, promoting to themselves, promoting to their friends, and then complaining that, you know, the music was dying, nobody was coming to the clubs anymore, there's no young people, and it's like, well, why do you think that is, you know? So... Um, we needed to change that. I mean, the music really was kind of on its knees. So, um, but Gary and I came to, came to it um, for a couple of reasons. So the first thing was that uh, we couldn't see people who looked like us. You know, this, is mu this originated as a black music and it was shocking to me to look on the scene and see nobody or very few people who looked like us actually playing this music. And it also wasn't being promoted to people like us either. So um, that needed to change. Um, also, this whole thing about young people is like, how do you get young people involved? Um, and also women. You know, there were very, very few women um, instrumentalists. Lots of singers, but um, not many instrumentalists. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's what it was like back then. And it's a very different picture now, thankfully. And you had a lot to contribute to that. So what yeah. sorts of things did you overcome uh, in those 32 years? What kind of hurdles were you faced with? Um, oh, golly. I think there was a lot of resistance to start with, you know. Um, f for myself, um, I, you know, I didn't come... I mean, I studied music when I was younger and everything, but when I met Gary, I was working in the city of London and... Um, I hated it, you know, um, and I met him whilst I was doing photography, actually, as a, as a, a hobby. And um, so coming into the music as somebody who wasn't a jazz musician but loved jazz, um, I think from a lot of the male musicians in particular, there was resistance, you know, because I just came in, it's like, oh, I've got some great ideas, I think we need to do this. And it's like, well, who are you? <laughs> you know, who are you to tell us? So there was that sort of problem, because there's always been misogyny in the, in the industry. So, um, and also promoters as well. Um, I suppose shaking them up and, and saying, well, we need to change the way you're talking about the music, um, the way you're um, presenting the music, um, the language you're using um, you know, on, on your promotions, all of that. Um, and then I suppose that, you know, the financial side of it w was really hard. It's very hard to, uh, with young musicians, everyone thinks, well, that's really cheap and easy to do. It's not, you know, musicians don't drive, they don't have cars, um, access to good instruments, um, access to rehearsal studios, they needed space, you know, so there were you know, quite a few um, challenges to, to get around, I think. One of the interesting things um, I find about Tomorrow's Warriors is that instead of going through the existing institutions, you know, the music schools that might already have some of those things that you talked about, you know, like transport instruments and all those things, instead of going that path, you created a new organization. Mm. That was, yeah. was that an active choice? Ad absolutely, um, because the changes that need needed to be made couldn't happen within the existing infrastructure. Um, it needed a new mindset and um, it just needed a new way of teaching. And, and the way uh, Tomorrow's Warriors has evolved and the way we look at it is really to, I suppose as, as Femi says in the film, it, it's like a, a musical youth club. You know, I don't know what it's like here. When I was growing up, we used to have youth clubs we could go to after school and just hang out, you play games, you, know, you listen to music, you do all sorts of things. So Tomorrow's Warriors was, I suppose, providing a, a, a safe space for young people, young musicians 
to come and just hang out together and to learn from each other. Um, for us, that's a very, um, I suppose, an African Caribbean uh, thing where, you know, our, our ethos is each one teach one, where you've got the elders passing on to the, to the younger people. And we've carried that through, I think, in the way we've developed tomorrow's warriors. So young people come along, we've given them a space and almost give them ownership of that space. And you have to trust them. You know, a lot of the time they... Tr in the existing structures, they try to control everything that the young people are doing. Whereas with Tomorrow's Warriors, we sort of, you know, just come, come and play. And then, you know, Gary would sort of leave them in a room somewhere, <laughs> you know, go off and then come back. They wouldn't always be playing music. Occasionally they'd go out and play football or they'd be dancing, learning dance steps and things. But it was to... I suppose let them discover, we, we say we let them discover the magic of the music by themselves. You know, we're not trying to indoctrinate them. We're not saying this is the way you do it. What we're doing is steering them and guiding them towards the music um, and letting them make what they will of it, you know. Um, so th that was kind of how, how we've done it. Um, and yeah, later, we, we, that has an impact on the way people make music as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, um, I think it's, it's freed up the music, you know, so that, and this particular to London, I think, we've got so many different cultures. It, London is a really big melting pot. And by allowing young people to bring their heritage, um, their traditions into that musical space, I think that's where you see, you know, that's how the London scene has evolved now. So you're hearing lots of different sounds. The music has gone in different directions. Um, yeah, so it, it's a lot of a freer space. So there is the focus on diversity, and I have some of your stats um, to show. Um, from 2021, 2022, I believe that was still kind of at the end of the COVID um, pandemic. Yes, so that's we were just why coming out of just coming out of it. Probably less concerts than there would have been in yeah. previous years. Yeah. Um, but as we can see, I think I have a laser pointer. Uh, yep. As we can see here, um, <laughs> this feels very officey. Um, <laughs> there is a really, really great balance of you know women and men. And when I say women and men, obviously there's not just two genders. Um, and when I say women, there's a lot of genders that are not you know one or the others. So just keep in mind when we talk about women in the conference and in this panel in particular, that we're not just talking about the two. Um, I think here there's also a statistic for trans and non-binary people, which is really cool. Um, but in general, the balance is really great. And there's a, a big focus on, on BAME, which, uh, you know, people of color or the global majority, as you've told me that you say this now. Um, so, you know, people with different ethnic backgrounds and different... Um, different, yeah, different backgrounds. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of text on this slide, but I just wanted to highlight that because later we're going to compare that to some Swiss numbers, which are <laughs> less rosy. Um, so I'm just going to go back to this so that there's not a lot of text on there. Um, what is interesting to me is, so it's kind of a really well-kept secret, but it's also really, really present in the London jazz scene. Um, how do young people find out about Tomorrow's Warriors? How do you even get there? It's mostly word of mouth. Um, we've never advertised for Tomorrow's Warriors because it's a free program. So you can imagine if you say to you tell the world, hey, there's this free program, they're all going to come. And um, we've already got a waiting list of, I think it's over 150 people now. So it's word of mouth. It's... Um, we get lots of inquiries when we do gigs because, you know, young people are seeing other young people on the stage and they want to be like them. So um, that's always a, a good way, a good space for, for recruiting um, other young people. Um, we also get referrals through the schools, through music teachers. Um, we, you know, we're quite regularly doing radio interviews and things and other people hear about us that way. Panels. Yeah, <laughs> we do panels. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of different ways. And, and the young people themselves, 
you know, they tell their friends and then they bring their friends, mm -hmm. you know. So we've, we've managed to build up this, this quite huge community now uh, of young people and who are not so young now, you know. <laughs> so um, it's like the other day we were thinking, my goodness, Soweto Kinch, who was part of this, um, I think he's 50 now. You know, and it's like, my goodness, you know, we still think of them. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, he's 40-something, right? I'm <laughs> just ageing him a bit. But, you know, like, Den for example, Dennis Baptiste is, is past 50, and he was one of the early ones. So um, it's, it's like you remember all these young people at the age when you first met them, um, which is always very amusing when they're telling us they're getting married or having kids. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you mentioned several times, and also in the video they mentioned this, that the, the, everything is free. How does this financial aspect work? I'm sure there's people in the crowd very interested in the finances of this. I thought you were going to say there are people in the crowd who want to donate. Oh, maybe. So they may be. <laughs> but, um, well, we're a charity um, and always have been. And, and one, of the, um, one of the things that we're adamant about is that we keep this free. Because by making it free, you immediately break down that financial barrier um, for a lot of young people. Um, as, we, as we were talking about earlier, you know, learning an instrument is expensive, getting an instrument is expensive. Um, and so to, if you want to um, invest in these young people, you've got to put the money there. It takes a long time to create a great jazz musician or any great musician. So... Our programme is free. We rely on funding from the Arts Council. It's a public funding um, from grants from trusts and foundations and from private donations as well. And we also um, we do gigs. You know, we do lots of concerts. And all of our um, profits go back into supporting the programme. So have the institutions that we were talking about at the beginning who were kind of, you know, pushing back on change, have they kind of, you know, bent at your will of, or at the success of Tomorrow's Warriors? Have they become more cooperative? Most definitely. And now, you know, they're partners now. So um, we have partnerships with some of the conservatoires in London and um, with, you know, other arts organisations, music organisations. Um, and that's important because it means they can um, they can learn from us. We can learn from them too. Um, but it's uh, I think it's it's starting to change the way music is taught. Um, we're seeing it as well in primary schools. You know, with the young kids and, and secondary schools, lots of people are contacting Tomorrow's Warriors now to to find out. You know, how can we rethink this? How can we we find a different mindset. Um, how can we change the way music is taught, you know, going forward? So it is happening. Um, I think with Tomorrow's Warriors, part of the problem when we started was that, you know, there were no teachers. You know, there were no teachers who looked like us and um, who were bringing their culture into uh, the music. What's happened now over the 32 years is that we have people like Binker Golding, for example, who we've trained up as a music leader. He's teaching in schools as well. Um, we have others, you know, I mean, there are too many of them. They all teach now. Um, there's another one on there, one of the pianists you saw, uh, Sultan Stevenson, who's a fantastic pianist, just sort of emerging now. He's one of our music leaders. And the more we develop those teachers and they go into the schools, that's how you start to change, you know, the, that whole mindset of how music is taught. So maybe as a closing question to this first part of the, chan of the panel, um, 32 years, a long time, do you have like three or maybe just one or however, however many <laughs> lessons you can think of, three big lessons of the last... 32 years? It's wow. a big question, I know. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, you know, we always say that as warriors, um, we, you know, nobody's going to give you anything. You know, you, you have to go and take stuff if you really want to change it. Um, because there are too many people out there with a vested interest in keeping things the same. So if you want to change things, um, 
I say you have to be warrior about it. You have to get gorilla on them. Is that where um, the name comes from as well? It, it is. It, it's, it's partly that. Um, but as warriors, I say you need to be bold, uh, brave and fearless. You know, you just have to go out there. Don't take no. If you want to change something um, and if you really believe in it, you just need to keep going, keep pushing through because eventually those doors, those barriers will, will come down. You know, don't wait for someone to open a door. Um, they're not going to. Not if they're comfortable with where they are. Um, but yeah, if you want to change the world, um, you just have to keep pushing it, keep pushing, keep pushing through. Sweeping declaration. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to come to the second part of the panel, um, and I want to introduce two more guests, um, two Swiss jazz musicians, Arthur Natek and Julie Campich. Come on stage. Okay. And if I update this, there we go. We've got all the names on there now. Um, so we've brought on two jazz musicians from Switzerland. We have Julie Campich, jazz harpist, harpist, hafenistin. Do you want to introduce yourself and maybe say how you found your way to jazz? Okay, um, so yeah, my name is Julie Campiche. I'm a jazz harpist based in Geneva. Um, I discovered jazz while I was um, a substitute to a um, harpist for a big band during the Jazz Contraband Festival. I was 20, and back then I never imagined myself um, as a professional because the classical uh, career wasn't made for me. <laughs> um, but then I discovered jazz on the rehearsal and on stage. I didn't understood anything of what was happening. <laughs> but I really fell in love with the creative process of it. And I said, okay, I don't know what's happening here, but I want to do it. It's called jazz. Okay, I want <laughs> to make harp, jazz harp. Oh, it doesn't exist. Let's try and see what happened. And, yeah. and here you are. And you did it. I am still trying. 20 minutes <laughs> later, I'm still having fun. So, um. so that's Julie Campiche. And we have Arthur Natek, drummer, composer. You're based here in Zurich. I, I live now in Zurich, but I'm also uh, born in Geneva. Um, I discovered the drums when I was very, very young. And I think I discovered maybe the concept of jazz through music education. So for sure, my, my first teacher was a jazz drummer. And I think because I didn't have a background in this culture, I, I was lucky to have a very musical family. But discovering this style of music really came from taking lessons. So someone showing me this instrument and this way of playing. But I guess in my life, uh, it really changed this relationship to jazz when I moved to New York City to continue my studies in jazz. And all of a sudden, it was really um, a completely different world because um, this concept of jazz that used to be a very school-driven, I was going to classes, I was playing workshops, I was talking about those famous names, those recordings, those labels. And all of a sudden, I moved to a city where that was the culture, that was the place. And the teachers I had there were people that played with all those legends. And so all of a sudden, it became, it became real. It became a, an actual connection to this culture. And I think um, it changed a lot of things for me, this experience of, of investing time and energy to go and spend time with people that really came from this culture. Yeah. So the reason I ask about you know, your, your approaches to jazz is because we've spoken with Janine now about this um, incredible organization and project in London, and now we want to look at the Swiss jazz scene and you know, figure out what's happening here. Are we maybe, are we may, where between 1991 and 2023 of the London jazz scene are we here in Switzerland at what stage? Um, and so I guess my question is kind of, what's your impression of the Swiss jazz scene in terms of diversity, in terms of who's playing and who's listening? Um, how do you two experience this? Maybe, Julie, if you can start. Um, 
Okay, I need to focus my my head on Swiss because I, I don't play only in Switzerland, so I have to <laughs> think about only the Swiss experience. Um, uh, for me, it's hard to um, separate the from also from my study. I studied in Switzerland, on, also in France, but it, yeah, it's a little bit hard to separate everything. But I'm, I'm going to do my best. Um, Maybe as input, you know, we heard this like. Um, this cliche of the male pale, how was it? Male stale and male male pale and stale. Male pale and stale. <laughs> of, Do you think of course, uh, I, of of course, there is some. Um, I don't know. I I have the feeling that I um, when I started 20 years ago, um, I it was a fact. It's like the fact that the harp is very complicated to transport. So. It's the same fact. It's a male environment, and I have to deal with it. So if I don't deal with it, I just change my job and I do something else, which is fine too. <laughs> But I, so as soon as it is a fact, I don't question it. And from the hashtag Me Too, and it changed. So now I am more asking about it. But for years, I didn't question it, perhaps that's the first thing, and um, I don't, I, I learned from the very, very beginning that I had to expect any help from anyone um, and do everything on my own, uh, like absolutely everything, um, um, so it's just count on yourself and do it and For what I observe, um, um, the, some um, I, I had some colleagues, me, male colleagues around me, also doing some amazing project and music. And most of the time, they had help. You know, very um, at least very quicker very earlier in their career. Help um, from institutions, from family. From, from whatever you know, it's it's always <laughs> difficult, difficult. Difficult. I don't. I I hate to complain. So um, it's complain. we're here to complain <laughs> today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, because I am here. I am, and I'm happy. So it's but it's but like it could be better. It's all about. Um, it's more about um, getting help from someone who will help you with the founding. Someone who will help you for the booking. Uh, a little help here and here and be being booked as a uh, opening band for that and that and it's not like one huge thing but it's a lot of different things mm -hmm. that um, that came very earlier for what I for what from my very subjective point of view mm -hmm. and so I'm um, not saying about statistic and stuff but so it's, um, yeah, it, it was not easy, mm -hmm. um, but I never give up. <laughs> I, I, f I, I continue doing it. Um, uh, and yeah, so it, back then, sometimes it was, it was very hard, and some of comments I could receive and stuff like that. Um, but then it, it also gave me the strength, the, the strength, strength. With strength that um, nobody can take that from me. It's so it's um, it's also give me the yeah. I am at the same time grateful for that, but mm -hmm. perhaps we we can improve and make it a little bit easier for the next woman. Yeah, hopefully. And so I guess maybe it's interesting to compare with your experience. Do you think you had an easier time or did you observe an imbalance between, for example, when you were studying jazz, between, you know, were there any women who were doing drums, for example? How was your experience of that? I mean, the first thing I can say is just to compare with, because that was the original question, right, about the video we saw. It's for sure my experience of learning to play jazz was definitely not this. It was not... Um, It was really mu very driven by, by, by a school, by an institution, by a place where you have to maybe follow 
pretty strict um, rules of how things are done and how um, exam-based things, right? And so this, I think this was my first um, concept of jazz, it was this idea that you go take lessons, it's a pretty intricate kind of music that requires a lot of technical things on any instrument, so I was, I think, very focused on this. But uh, like I said before, what changed a lot is all of a sudden to move to, um, of course, again, I was very, um, I guess that's maybe the, where the second question is like, I was very lucky to probably find this support very early on in my life that allowed me when I was 19 to move very far away. I mean, to I, I realize only now how crazy this was that when I was 19, I moved alone to New York City and I lived there for five years. But it changed everything, like I said before, because all of a sudden, I, I wasn't really used to playing with people my age in Switzerland, in Geneva. Um, I was going to those jazz uh, workshops in IMR, which is a um, cool institution in, in Geneva that always try to get younger people to play this kind of music. But I was most of the time playing with people 10, 15 years older. And then that changed, of course, in New York, where I met a, pia a piano player from Japan and a, a guitar player from France, and we're all the same age, and we all have maybe very different background, but the same love of this music. So I guess I didn't really think about it. That's, that's probably <laughs> says a lot about it, but I was just so driven by, by this instrument and this music that it took me actually a lot of time to realize that in New York, I could I could have kind of friends and that do the same thing. So um, I'm not sure if this was related to the <laughs> original question, but for sure I, I felt all of a sudden that this thing of cultural uh, background, this thing of, of gender was just way less of a, a situation just because no one, most of the time, people that end up in New York are coming from all around the world. So you you actually become a family in this jazz uh, school. At least that was my experience, that all of a sudden um, all that background was not so important. And it was important in Switzerland? I don't know. I actually don't know, but I felt that, yes, I was just um, in the situation that I was at that age, pretty alone. I was alone just because it was not so cool to be 14 and practicing bebop drumming, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I don't know if it's cool today, I don't know, but <laughs> it was just what I was doing, and um, that changed all when I met someone, you know, who comes from Chile and is super into bebop drumming as well. <laughs> okay, fair, so we have some different experiences here. Um, you're talking about New York, which is an equally kind of dynamic place. Obviously, the demographics are very different in London than they are here. I mean, we're comparing a city, really, to the whole country of Switzerland. But London has more inhabitants, I think, than the entirety of Switzerland. I don't have the exact numbers, but um, everything's very dense in London, not so much in Switzerland. Um, I pulled some statistics from um, the internet um, on... Um, what we've got going on here. And I think a lot of this kind of reflects what Julie was telling us about. So kind of to decode what's on here. This is from a study um, by the... Uh, I think maybe the writing is in black, so we can't see it, but... No, the, 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 the source is down here, but yeah. So I pulled these from the website of Helvetia Rockt, which is a Swiss organization that promotes women and other marginalized genders on the stages in the music industry and behind the stage as well, so, you know, in the technical branches and all that. Um, they have this on the website. This is from a study done by Pro Helvetia together with the Gender Institute at the University of Basel. And so I think the most relevant for us is the one over here, the red one, which is pop, rock, and jazz together. I unfortunately couldn't find anything specifically on jazz, but we see that there is... 11% um, of the people on stage are women or other marginalized genders versus 89% men, which is a massive difference. And I, I can only assume that that percentage is about the same in all three of those genres. And as Janine was saying, probably most women in these genres are singers and not so much instrumentalists. 
Um, over here we have music production and also teaching staff, which is um, another important bit, I think. Um, so I guess a question for you, Janine, that I was wondering earlier with Tomorrow's Warriors. When you get people um, that are applying for Tomorrow's Warriors, what are the kind of percentages? Do you, is, there, is there still that kind of trend that a lot of young boys are applying, maybe a lot of white boys... Do these trends exist? Uh, absolutely. Um, it, on our um, waiting list, we have... Um, sorry, but it's, but it's a lot of white male drummers for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but, but there's a lot of them. And, um, but, you know, it, we, we can only take so many people on our programme, and so we're always making sure that we are um, prioritising... Uh, women, you know, girls and, and women, um, and uh, global majority people of colour, um, because that is our primary purpose as a charity. Um, that doesn't mean to say we're exclusively that. We will have uh, lots of other people involved as well, um, because we're about building community. But we do need to focus very hard on the demographics of, of the people that we want, you know, the... the the people that we want to reach, you know, this scares me. It's like, you need tomorrow's warriors. You really do. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it's horrific, really. And, and you have to question, like, how is this happening? Um, who is making decisions? All right? Um, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, and what, what you were saying is that you don't want to complain. It's like, damn, you need to complain. That, you know, and until you actually start to feel a bit angry about it and think this is not good enough, then, you know, nothing will change because you're accepting the status quo. Um, somebody needs to do something about this. And it's not hard. It's about making conscious decisions as to who do you have in your band? Who do you get to be your sound engineer? Who is your producer? You know, who's going to be your teacher? And you have to be supportive of each other. Women need to support each other. Believe me. I, you know? I, I mainly work with women now. Yeah. Uh, like, my, my we're, team we're around nicer. me is, is women. <laughs> we're, we're, we're much better. At it. Sorry, no. But um, seriously, though, um, you know, it, it's about justice at the end of the day, isn't it? It's, it's social justice. And if you want to have um, equality, equity, um, diversity, all the itties, <laughs> um, then you need to do something about it. You know, make a conscious decision. Next time you're putting your, I don't know how many musicians are in the room, but next time you're putting your band together, have a think, you know, think further than your immediate circle. It's like, how can I change this? Because you'll get something different. You will, you know. I mean, I know in business, they say that, um, you know, the more diverse your team is, the better results that you get. You know, the more diversity of thought is there. And I think that applies too in, in terms of bands. You know, the different kinds of... Um, the flavours, the creativity that you get from working with people who are different from you, it really opens it up, you know, and you can create magic from that. So, yeah, you need to do something about this. <laughs> so, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because obviously Helvetia Rockt is an organisation that is working against this, as is Pro Helvetia, um, in part, I assume. But I asked you earlier about um, having chosen to go, you know, around the institutions rather than through them. And I think a lot of what's being done in Switzerland goes through the institutions, through the music schools. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and um, a problem that a lot of music schools have is that there's less women who apply. You know, as or, um, I, I've spoken to a few um, of the people in charge of the admissions, and often you have um, a lot less women who apply. And then specifically, Instrumentalists, almost no women, or very few. Um, and then singers, there's always quite a few women. So there's something happening before people apply to school. What are the kind of hurdles, maybe Julie, you can talk about this. What are the kind of hurdles that young women and girls face? Or like, what is the reason why there are less? It's also a big question, but what's your view? I can give my point of view, but I am not a... <laughs> 
social studying stuff, but I, of course I have been thinking about it. I was the only instrumentalist doing my whole um, classes in the high school in Lausanne, so obviously I notice it. Um, I, uh, I think the, the first thing is you have to, if you want to apply there, uh, to a high school, bachelor, master, blah, 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 then you have to project yourself and see you as a performing artist, professional performing artist. And if you can't project yourself in this image, you won't apply. That's the first thing. And to see yourself in that, um, um, y you, it, you will have to feel safe about it, I I'm guessing. So at least I, I think it's something important. And in Switzerland, we don't have any statute, official statute, uh, administrative statute for musicians, for artists, all kind of art, but here we are speaking for music. So it's very un un unsafe, uh, actually. Financially, administrative, uh, in an administrative way. Um, so it's a big risk for for everyone. But what I what I heard and the few study I I read, it's that mostly in the society outside music, but the woman needs to uh, will have the the, the safe role in the family in the in the um, in the society they they will do safe um, and so as the artist situation isn't safe in switzerland um, i'm guessing it's a huge um, border to project yourself um, and so that will be the, f the first thing then also, and it gets worse um, when you go uh, above 30, because then there is the children questions, and so it makes all the safety questions stronger. Um, You're a mother yourself, so you can yeah. speak to this. Yeah. How has that experience been? Um, I, I'm happy to say that it's better now that my daughter is six years old, it's easier now than it was when she was born. <laughs> when she was born, I kept it um, very strongly for myself. <laughs> uh, there was people from didn't know in the professional um, environment that didn't know that I was a mother until she was one year old. Um, but and I was very lucky because my mother, um, she's a very strong woman, and uh, she came on tour with me, so she could take care of my baby while I was playing and not available. And so I had a free babysitter available all year long, <laughs> 24 hours per day. So that was um, I couldn't do it as strong. I, I couldn't be as active as I am without her. Um, but and also back then, I couldn't really ask for financial help for children care, for example, when I am on tour. That's something that changed, for example. Now you can apply for that, you can say it, you can name it. It's not a, a shame thing. So that's, that's really changing. And um, when, I, when my daughter was three months old, for example, I was invited to... Um, to a female meeting in Sweden, uh, and we, we, we had to, to play a concert. It was all female band from all over Europe. And so my partner was the plus one, so the babysitter, and I was playing. So it, and it was very, very, f I, I didn't um, anticipate it, but it was all the reverse. So I was the professional playing on stage, while my partner was the babysitter, and 
it was all women on stage, and he was there with the <laughs> baby and stuff. And it was it was amazing. And in, in there, they really welcomed the baby. They were really welcome. It was very natural, actually. And but I I noticed when I spoke with my colleagues I was on stage with, sh they were like, ah, what's happening here? Like. Some some of them told me I, I decided not to have children because I want to be a performer artist and I can do both. So I decided like that very very strongly. And some other told me, "Wow, it's very inspiring. You can do both. How is it?" I gave I gave um, for example I gave um, uh, speeches about how to deal with the. I was invited for in, in a few places to do that. So I'm, I'm guessing helping with, so my point, sorry, um, is that helping the, the, the woman to project themselves as performer artist um, and imagine that they don't have to choose between, so between being mother and performer will help them to project themselves there and also having uh, clear rules about how is it administrate administration money stuff for example in france they have you can criticize the system but at least there is a system in switzerland we are not here yet <laughs> there is no system there is no rules so uh, or there is severance, but it's all very like that. <laughs> so there would be some legal solutions. Yeah, some. Solutions. So you can project yourself. You know the rules. Then you accept. You don't accept. But at least it's clear. The unclear um, doesn't help to mm -hmm. step in. Or, or it it take. I could do it because I have a very strong and powerful family behind me. So it was a risk, but I, I, I could take it thanks to my family, not thanks to the um, system. So we're talking a lot about visibility, being able to see people like yourself on stage, which is what Janine mentioned as well, being really important. I think part of that is also from the curriculum, right? The people that were taught about, the, the great jazz players. Um, maybe Arthur, do you have like a memory of the sorts of things that you were learning about during your studies that were inspiring to you and you know were they reflecting of the diversity of jazz or in particular of the Swiss jazz scene? I mean then again that's uh, talking specifically about the Swiss jazz scene is hard for me because I have a feeling though those important critical years that I had um didn't happen here or in actually. New York. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. I also had this was not part of the scene so much, and then I came back uh, ten years after that, and then rediscovered it. So that I guess it's a whole different discussion. But you were talking mostly about the the way you study the music and how you discover the legacy, or yeah. And I suppose in jazz canon, I mean. I, I'm a jazz enthusiast myself, and for a long time, I, you know, you know all the greats, you know John Coltrane, Miles Davis, you know the the really big names. And if you want to discover the women of jazz who aren't singers, you kind of have to go digging a little bit. So the kind of the canon of the jazz greats, do you think it represents, you know, different kinds of people? No, for sure, uh, for sure, the the names that are that we kind of use as uh, probably staples of the of the legacy is for sure biased, like most of the numbers we see on the mm. board now. But um, yeah, for me, it was it was just, it's, it's hard. It was just like specifically in New York, way less of a, of a question just because I was surrounded. I don't know if it was 50-50 actually in that school where I was, that would be interesting to know exactly, but I, I was, kind of surrounded by great um, female instrumentalists uh, immediately in my studies there. So I guess I just thought uh, less about it. Yeah. Perhaps about the studying, I, I just, 
I just thought now that from the moment I decided to study jazz and become a mus professional musician, I didn't get any woman uh, as as teacher. From, uh, from I was in France, in Geneva, in Lausanne, I was no one, not one woman in the whole process. And we are talking about 15 years of studying. So it's, um, well, it's... Uh, Do you teach now? I was, but unfortunately I don't have time anymore to do it like regularly. But um, uh, yeah, momentarily I have to <laughs> prioritize like performing family and the... <laughs> Uh, but uh, I study very little, very focused moments. But um, I love it. But, yeah. I think some of the, the things that you mentioned uh, about the systemic change that needs to happen for women to be able to um, pursue a professional career as a musician, you know, and particularly, you know, being a mother, you know, I'm a mother as well, and I, you know, I was carrying our daughter around while we were going on tour with Gary. Um, but th there are things that need to change, you know, like having uh, somewhere to, to change your baby, you know, having childcare facilities, you know, when you're on tour. You know, there are all sorts of things that need to, to happen and can happen if only we think about it, which is why I say, you know, do complain about it. Because if you don't, then everything will just stay the same. It's, it's interesting what you said, Arthur, about, um, you know, when you went to New York and being surrounded by women straight away, you know, um, that's the norm there. So you, you, you didn't need to think about it. You know, and that's the place we need to get to, where you're used to seeing women or others, whoever the others are, in your space. You know, and it won't happen. You know, in a, in a place like Switzerland, it's not going to happen by accident. You have to be quite conscious about making that happen. When you were, you know, starting up and in the beginning phases of Tomorrow's Warriors, or even now still, did you did you um, experience this dynamic between you know the women and men who were applying, and even within the courses, was there a different dynamic between the genders? Most definitely, and you know we at Tomorrow's Warriors we we decided to create a space for women and and people identifying as women, um, so that you know they could use that time and space to develop confidence, to support each other, to create a, a kind of a community that they could feel safe in, but also then to make them go back in the room with the boys um, to face off that testosterone in the room, um, you know, so they can become more resilient in a space that has a majority men. So, um, you know, that was a conscious decision. And now, although we're seeing, you know, more women um, applying to conservatoire and um, what we're hearing now is uh, about the issues women face in the conservatoires. For example, and I don't want to... I don't want to get too deep into it, but even just, you know, the ladies' toilets, the sort of things that women need in the ladies' toilets aren't in the ladies' toilets, you know, because nobody thought about it, because they're not used to having women in the space. You know, it's systemic things like this that, that um, we need to focus on, as well as just getting women into those spaces. But they don't feel that, uh, that comfortable. You know, we're finding that some of the uh, young women that we've got in conservatoire now, they're not being selected for, you know, when there's a big band or whatever. It's always, oh, well, you know, this guy is better than you, you know. They're not going to change anything if they don't make a conscious decision to put a woman in that place. So, yeah, that, that's just how it is, but we have to just keep complaining. That's actually a really good point, is where do the responsibilities lie? You've talked a lot about, you know, you need to push through the doors that are shut yourself, um, and someone selecting an orchestra or a big band or whatever. What, where do the responsibilities lie, for example, with venues? Are venues responsible for you know, a certain diversity in what they show on their stages? Question to... I would say it's like for everything, everyone is responsible. We are all part of a system, so everyone is. Um, so, of course, yes, the venue, uh, 
as the label, as the promo as the booking agency, as the musician when they choose with who they are playing. Uh, it's uh, it's it's on everyone, on every one of us. We are, it's 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 a big and at the, the same time it's a very little family, I would say. So it's uh, yeah, everyone should just do his best, and it's yeah. I just want to just pause a bit this idea and just kind of focus maybe on a different style of music because. I guess I'm lucky now to live in Zurich for a couple of years and I've seen many things of that sort happening. Not so much in the jazz scene, but um, just mention a few of those projects led by uh, Blau Blau. There's this event that happens, it's called the Blau Blau Alle Sterne, um, that I was part of a few times and that was very much focused on, on thinking about um, uh, gender and stuff like this. Just so I have a feeling there's we're talking about all the responsibility that anyone could take. I think they're uh, they're happening very often, but it's more often than not I see this uh, a bit outside of the jazz scene. It's hard to know Which why. Which genre outside of the jazz scene? I mean, Zurich has a very incredible um, experimental, let's say, scene of music where um, it's hard to put a style on it, but it's venues that actually don't connect to uh, music style or genres, uh, places that are maybe showing less mainstream kind of music. Uh, I have a feeling there's a lot of space. I mean, Elvesia Rockt that we have now on the board, there's a lot of things that are happening that are uh, ex extremely positive, but it's true that sometimes it's frustrating how it's that it's actually slightly displaced that from those more common uh, jazz venues, I would say. And also about when I say, you know, I don't like to complain is because it takes a lot of energy. And um, so my, my way to manage that was to, I'm not complaining, I'm doing my stuff. When there is resistance somewhere, I don't push. I go where there is response. And what I noticed in the long term is that where there were resistance, now there is less. And I I'm don't want to lose energy by convincing people with talking. I'm convincing by doing. I just do it. And um, I had some good response at the beginning, even outside of Switzerland. And then it came back, and it's it's all. And so when it comes back, and when there is less resistance, so I come without any anger or anything. It's just okay. Now now you are interested. Nice. Let's talk, and it's good. And um, that's my way to do because that's my character, and everyone should just do the way. The, um, she or they feel uh, it's uh, it's important to respect your your own uh, yeah limitation of energy and f for about responsibility it's not only on <laughs> on women for that to to complain it's like it's it's a whole just together and and yeah because it's yeah it's hard to to do and me and me and it's not very comfortable situations to say that so yeah I, I, I agree. I mean, when I say keep pushing, I mean, I think that's more a case of just, you know, when you hit a barrier, just, you know, you have to find a way through it one way or another. Um, and we have to find the path of least resistance. Um, and that's really important because of the energy it, it, it takes. Um, so when I say keep pushing, I mean, it's just keep, you know, just keep doing what you need to do. Just keep going with it. Because as you're right that, you, you know, you can keep trying to, you know, force somebody to, to open a door for you and they're not going to do it. So you have to just find a way around, you know. Eventually, they will come around to your way of thinking, you know, as, as we've seen. Um, but that whole thing about, you know, not accepting the the status quo, I think, is, is really course. what it is, isn't it? That, um, yeah, we we just have to keep saying, no, this this isn't good enough. It can be better. And I think that's the way we should all think about it, is that it can be better. You know, and who doesn't want better? 
fair. Yeah, good point. <laughs> um, you've mentioned some organizations and some projects outside of the jazz world who are really pushing for this sort of stuff. Um, have you experienced any of that in the jazz world? And if so, why do you think that hasn't really transferred into the jazz world? Uh, I mean, I'm experiencing it right now. I mean, again, it's my experience, but through the ZHDK, so the, the Zurich uh, University for the Arts here, um, I'm linked to the jazz uh, department there. And um, there's quite a lot of change happening at the moment, and also a lot of discussions of that sort. Um, there were uh, some new positions that are changed on the faculty that uh, are going more towards uh, a, a better gender balance. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the one place that I can say that it's, it's an extremely important discussion that's happening. And um, there's a lot of great people that are, you know, we mentioned before, we were supposed to be joined today by Gregor Hilbe, but... Um, uh, a lot of other people in this department that are that are creating, I think, a lot of change. Again, you can say it's cool. It's for sure. It's tiny. It's just one school. It's the one that I know the most, so it's the only one I can talk about. But but um, I think there's there's a lot of um, very slow but um, change happening. Yeah. Very slow, but there is change happening. Have you experienced it the same? Uh, yes, definitely. And also the young women, they are so inspiring. <laughs> when when I left the the when I finished my master in Lausanne, uh, they just um, started an association for uh, women, uh, for the female who was studying there, because there were much more than when I started, and. And yeah, so I am still. I, I, j I still receive the message and I input when I can. But they are so active and they are so efficient, and they are, they, we, they they started to have like um, conversation about um, how how to feel safe in the school. And for example, I don't know. There is some some of the the girls who say when I need a break, I just I just go to the girl bathroom. That's the only place. I feel safe, so, it, it, and it's not about being safe. They, they were not aggressively aggressed by anyone. Everyone is is nice. It's not about that, but it's just a lot of little things that come and come and come. And I experienced it too, and it was. Um, but well, I, I was, I I I was more. Um, uh, alone back then, but uh, yeah, like how to, it, it's some very little stuff, but how to fight to have a solo during um, a program uh, for a concert with the, one of the classes, you know, and it's about from, and I had a lot of bad experience back then. I am a woman and I play harp, so, well, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no harp. But, um, so, well, I had not a lot of chances. But it, and it was not, I completely understood it was not against me or it was not because they didn't thought I was able to or blah, blah, blah. It was just reflex, like instinct. And also because, because all the, the, the male were like, hey, me, me, me. And there, it was very natural for them. And for me, it was like, oh, I have to ask. Oh, I have to, like, because I feel insecure and blah, blah, blah. And so it, it was not that easy. And then I... From once I said, okay, from the very beginning, I said, okay, I, I really would like to have a solo for this program, but can we decide from the very beginning? Because most of the time it was at the end, oh, Julie doesn't have a solo, so uh, you will improvise on this one. So it was like 10 minutes before going on stage, you never practice, you was like, Bleh! okay, so I said, but from the very beginning, I would like to have a solo, but decided from the beginning so I can practice. That will really help me and blah, blah, blah. But at the end, we arrive at the same situation. And then they said, OK, you can improvise there. And I said, no, I won't do it. I didn't practice. I didn't have the, the same chance of the others. And, they, and it became to be a fight. And I was so angry because I didn't say anything for 
X years. So it was like, okay, so I should have spoken earlier, but at the same time, it was hard, and you know, because I didn't have this group of women that was when I left, that, that is now when, and so it was, I didn't have the skills, I didn't, and I think the new generation from women and also from male have much more skills to name stuff and to understand and because at the end the, the fight I had it was very good and I think everyone understood at the end but it was very it was all on me on me to ask on me to say no on me to explain why I'm angry and, and it was and this is this is asking a lot, and my job at, back then was just to learn how to play normally. So it's, um, I think, yeah, there is a lot of changes now because the, the women organize, also there is, like, uh, as I said, much more words, and yeah, it's um, also, for example, in French, you know, I just spoke with someone that said, it's not on music, but she's a fire, uh, the, the guy who... A firefighter? Fi yeah. Um, and she, she told me, yes, but... Um, and I, we were ex um, speaking about the name of it uh, in, in for the woman. And she says, but I don't like it, you know, in... in when you say it in, in French, uh, it's the pompier. Which is, it sounds strange when you are used to it, but she, but she told me, but the young, uh, the young pompier, they say it very naturally. For them, it's normal to, say, to name it with the woman. Um, uh, you don't have that in English, but uh, yeah. 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 But in, in, and it's very powerful, and the, the new generation, they change. So I, I think it's all about um, yeah, being, being inspired by them because uh, you know you said about uh, Tomorrow Wire, it's about the, um, like uh, you learn from the, uh, the older. Uh, I think we can learn from the youngest <laughs> here. That's really nicely said. I think um, I'm going to start rounding us off with maybe a last question. Um, a lot of the last couple of things we spoke about, it it's all kind of feels like you know we're, we're moving in the right direction in Switzerland. It's going a little slowly. I think it's going slowly everywhere, probably. Um, but it's, you know things are happening. There's, as you say, there's um, a newer generation who maybe isn't as accepting or, or is questioning the status quo, as, as Janine said. Um, so, and, and you know, the institutions are changing, as you were talking about, said Tarika. Um, is there anything else that you two have kind of taken with you now as a takeaway from Tomorrow's Warriors, maybe from what we spoke about, what's happening in London? I mean, there's one element that inspired me a lot in the video, and you actually, you mentioned it, is this idea of like putting a nice group of people together and kind of let let those people find their sound. And I kind of like, I don't see a place where this is being used so much in Switzerland in terms of how you teach music. Um, I have a feeling there's quite a lot of, uh, welcome to this school, this is what you should know, this is how it works first learn all that stuff you know there's a bit less of that freedom of like you know what we could maybe be inspired by because i guess that's that was always my favorite side of jazz was actually the 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 mix of all the different styles i mean in my own personal life i have a feeling i've kind of never made such traditional jazz i was always in, interested in those mix and nowadays very clearly i'm very much focused on this electronic side of music but I have a feeling this space is something we could learn to include it in the way we teach uh, this music because it is about improvising together. It's not so much about uh, how it used to be this virtuoso, extremely technical kind of music. And this, this idea of putting people together and say, maybe, yeah, maybe doing a dance and going to play sports outside and then doing a bit of music, this actually creates community 
and uh, through community you usually find a sound and this is not something I exper experimented with so much in, in, the, re in the first phase of uh, mm -hmm. learning the instrument. It's for sure happening outside but you, you have to do it way later in your life and so um, I think this is something we should learn about and uh, apply it more here. And as we make those spaces, we make sure that they're, you know, safe and open for women and other genders and people with different backgrounds as well. That would be ideal. Right? Of course, yeah. of course, yes. Julie, any last impressions? Yeah, uh, I would, I would, so for me, first of all, it's so inspiring. It's like, it, give, it gives, a, I don't know, it gives, I, I, I want to dance when I... <laughs> When I, I heard about Tomorrow's Warrior and I sent the links to your website to several friends and said, yeah, you have to check that, that's so cool. So it's, it's really like, it, it makes me feel good. Um, we think jazz harp is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, I would say, and what I, I feel, it makes good to, to hear that you assume the way that you um, give the priority to women and minority um, BAM, I don't know exactly the name of it, but um, here is something we are very, um, uh, how do you say, it? Uh, frilo, uh, uh, are a little bit scared about f um, giving clearly the priority of like, okay, there is an equal, there is something that has to be balanced. So we, we here we think more about equality, equality than equity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, it feels good and it's inspiring to feeling good about equity too. And um, yeah, that would be my inspire, inspiration of it. I think, it, it, you know, we talk about if you can't see it, you can't be it. And we have to make sure everyone can see it, you know. And um, that whole thing around equity is just so important. You know, it, we've had lots of programs that have said about equality of opportunity. But it's not just equality of opportunity, it's equality of outcome as, as well. You've got to make sure that people can actually access all the opportunity and um, have access to all the the rewards and you know the riches of, of, that comes out of it as well and and make it possible for people to engage um, equally you know so yeah I think that sums it up really really well thank you so much for all your inputs um, we do have a questions and answers part um, so, if the audience has any questions for anyone in particular or for generally the panel, there is a microphone being handed around, so you can just put your hand up. And if you're uncomfortable asking in English, you can also ask in German, if you would like, or French. Hi. Um, I just want to start by saying how incredibly humbled and honored I am to hear you speak, Janine, too. Um, that you took time, this incredible and very thoughtful labor of love, 30 years, Gary knew, and, and to make the world a better place, and you did it, um, and, and dare I say, cooler. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that it sparks discussion. I'm happy we're having this discussion. Um, gender is an important discussion, um, and the statistics speaks for the, speak for themselves. We, we need to do something. But I, I have to say that after uh, over an hour of discussion, I'm also a little disappointed that we're having a very partial discussion. And I think I, I, I want to kind of put a, a dare out there to us white people. We need to go away from here, read the right books, and come back and have a discussion about race. We're not capable of doing it. Switzerland is still not capable to talk about race, to put on a panel, and to hear a room of white people theorize about gender um, in jazz. When jazz is an Afro-American culture, we know it, it was made by people of color. And um, people of color are need today <laughs> 30 years in, of initiative to find a way back in of a space that was originally theirs. We need, we us white people need to go away. It's not the, anybody else's job, it's our own job. Read the books, they're out there. 
let, let's educate ourselves, come back next year and have a discussion about race and the global majority. Thank you for that input. I completely agree. Did anybody want to add anything? Uh, I, yeah, no, I don't, yeah, of course I agree. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, of course I agree. I, I, when I was studying in Lausanne, there were one Metis guy, um, and I, I spoke with him about it, and and he told me he felt he felt very lonely and very un, not understood by by the institution and the staff and it it was very yeah i think i of course we have a lot a lot to learn uh, on this subject i th i think it's really um it's, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing i mean we haven't found this in london you know and i did, i've sort of thought a lot about how did it even get to here um you know you have uh, the conservatoires teaching jazz yet they had no uh black musicians um either on the course or teaching it um and then when it comes to well what are you teaching them then? How are you talking about the music? And I think if you're going to go back to the roots of the music and you have to start uh, talking about where the music came from, how did it happen? Um, what's the story there? And I think it becomes quite hard for, for um, white people to be talking about, you know, the history of the music, uh, about enslaved people and, you know, the culture that, that came from that. So, you know, over time, it will change because we're seeing, you know, more and more people of colour um, teaching music in schools and in the conservatoires. You know, it's, I think it's important too to talk about the, the whole um, gender thing as well. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't beat yourselves up too much, but I think it's a very valid point. You know, I don't know what the, um, you know, how many uh, black people, what the mix is here in Switzerland. But I have seen, you know, I've seen pictures of black people all over the place as we came from the airport and, you know, in some of the galleries along the way. Um, and I've seen black, pe black people in the streets, but I haven't seen any here. So, I don't know. But but you told we spoke about the subject uh, when we prepared the <laughs> the conference and um, you t you told us that there is n not even statistic mm -hmm. on the subject. That's which is worth how, mentioning how far in we itself. Are. Troubling that that is really which troubling is that we're, you know they're not even going to count them. <laughs> you know they're not that, that that that's not important and it's it says a lot. You know it does speak a lot. Um, to attitudes to, to race. I should say, I couldn't find any. Maybe they exist. I couldn't find any on, you know, ethnic and, and otherwise different, like, socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, is also not a statistic that I could find. Um, but maybe they exist, and I just wasn't looking enough. But I think it's, an, it's a really good point, so thank you for raising that. Uh, uh, what I... Obviously, I, I, I thought about it, and it's... Um what I have the feeling that we are so late on all these subjects in Switzerland, but so late that um, the start, if you start with gender, uh, it will help also all minority. And then there is also specific uh, things that has that has to be done for every minority and subject on that. But um, the. Um, the first steps will help everyone that is in this minority. Uh, that's my instinct, my guess, but uh, I'm not a specialist on this. Do we have any other questions? I have a question otherwise. I asked at the beginning kind of as a joke, but now I am actually interested from what you've heard now on this panel and maybe talking to people in the hallways. Um, this is kind of a, it's kind of a mean question, but um, from 
so Tomorrow's Warriors has existed from 1991 to today. So on a scale of 1991 to today, where do you think Switzerland is in terms of progress compared to London? Which, again, is a very, it's a very bold comparison, um, but just your impressions. It's really difficult for me to answer that question. It, it's not really fair, but based on the numbers I saw up there, um, I think you're at um, you're, you're right at the beginning. You're you know it's square one. You're you're kind of back in 1991 for us. So <laughs> yes, yeah, but um, but that you know, but you have to start somewhere. I think recognizing that there is a problem is the first step, um, and then starting to think about, well, how do we address this problem? But I think the first thing really is seeing it as a problem because some people don't see it as a problem. Some people think it's just fine. You know, everything's hunky-dory. Uh, we're going along fine, thank you. You know, so there, of course there will be people out there who, who don't want to change anything because they're comfortable, you know. Um, but th those figures are scary um, because it affects so many things, you know, when you're saying there aren't any, you know, you didn't see any female teachers. I mean, this is core stuff, you know, it's basic stuff. And it will impact what happens later. Teachers are the, are the people who train <coughs> the society of the future. And if we're not seeing women in there, then I think, you know, Houston, we have a problem. So, yeah, we, we have to recognize a problem and then find solutions to it. So Switzerland, you know, get moving on it. <laughs> As As an example, uh, again, it's very personal, but um, when my daughter was three, she, she talked to me about saxophone and I said, OK, you would like to play saxophone? She, and she laughed at me and said, but mama, it's an instrument for boys. And I was like, no. I turned on YouTube for the first time of her life and she saw so many saxophone female player, but she had never seen a female playing. So for her, for her three years old brain, it was not for her. And it was, I was really shocked. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's very, very powerful. The what you what you said, the, the need of of this uh, experience, experiencing women or any minority in, um, in, in position so that we can project ourselves in anything we would like to go. Was it you who said to me about the, that the was buyer? Me. It was, yes, it, that it? was me. Yeah, so you know, going back to um, we created this space for, for women to be you know, just amongst, uh, amongst themselves. Um, uh, it was called the, the Female Collective. And out of the Female Collective came Neria, which is Nabai Garcia, uh, Shirley Tete on guitar, Sheila Maurice Gray on trumpet, uh, Rosie Turton on trombone, um, Cassie Kenoshi on alto sax, uh, Lizzie Excel on, on drums, and oh gosh, what was her name on bass? I've forgotten on bass, but we've got they changed to Rio in the end. But anyway, out of this, just giving them that one session a week <coughs> where they could have a couple of hours at the South Bank Centre, just working together, you know, and that created Neria, and that's where all these women that you saw in, in this video, that's where they came from. So it's not hard. That was just one session a week. You know, give them a space. Let them, let them do it. And from that, so many uh, other women have been inspired to pick up a saxophone or a trombone or a trumpet. You know, so that's how you create the change. It's not hard. It's not hard, everyone. <laughs> um, if there's no other questions, I think uh, we have another question. Neria played there, by the way. <laughs> I have a, a 
question about the official. I don't know how the official teaching system is uh, in uh, in England. Is it through conservatories or universities? Did your experience or your example had long term now a, a, an impact on them? Are they more? Is it more diverse also now in the conservatories and and is it related to your your example? Absolutely. Um, when we first started. Um, I remember we had to, when we were applying for funding and we had to put in some numbers, you know, as to, to justify that funding and we'd contact the conservatoires and say, so how many female musicians have you got on your jazz course? And it, there might be one or two if you're lucky. Um, and then how many black people have you got? Any, any Or any colour <laughs> have you got? And they would say... We can't tell you that because we might, you might be able to identify the person. And it's like, well, of course we know who they are. We, de we develop that person. You know, we know their parents, you know. So now um, we have more and more um, women. We have more uh, people of colour um, taking up uh, places on conservatory, even applying to conservatory because before they weren't even applying, you know. So, um, and we tend to... Um, steer them towards one particular conservatoire. I mean, but they go to all the conservatoires, but by concentrating a, a group of people in one place, you can help build that community, and that makes them stronger. Because there's nothing worse, you know. And I've felt this as a black woman in the industry, where you're going into a room and you are the only one. Right, so if it was bad enough that I was, you know, probably the only woman, and it was really bad that I was the only person of colour as well, because um, then you're having to sort of represent everybody, you know. Um, so I think it, at conservatoires, it was really important that we start to get, you know, more people who look like you, you know, or have a similar background to you, and when you can concentrate a group of people in that space, they feel more secure. And then having built that community in that space, they all grow up together, they all get used to being around others. Um, it's, it's a safer space and a stronger space. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to have to cut off the, discuss the discussion at this point, unfortunately, for time reasons. Um, but thank you for the questions and thank you all again for being here. Um, and so I guess... From my end, I think I have a, a thank you slide. Yes. Oh, oh no. That's the, that's the thank you slide. Um, thank you again to everyone, to the audience, for, to the guests for being here. And I hope we continue these discussions you know, in the hallways and in future panels and in a panel next year where we talk more explicitly about race as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.